Okay, so, reading Kingdom of Fear by Hunter S. Thompson to Rachel while she's in China. She's not in China yet, I'm going to start reading anyway. It's a long book. There's a forward, there's a forward by Timothy Ferris. I don't need to read that. You've, you've read the forward by Timothy Ferris. If you haven't read the forward, if you're not Rachel, buy the book. It's very cheap. Weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread. For he on honey dew hath fed, and drunk the milk of paradise. Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Memo from the sports desk. I was watching the Denver Oakland football game on TV last night when it was interrupted by a breaking news bulletin from the FBI about unknown terrorists who were planning to destroy major targets all over the United States, perhaps within 24 hours. The FBI had learnt this from trustworthy sources, the unseen voice explained. The American people were advised to be totally vigilant and ready to be evacuated at any moment. Any person who talks suspiciously or looks dangerous should be reported to your local police or law enforcement agencies immediately. We were into condition red! Shit! Not again! cried my lawyer. I have to fly to Boston tomorrow. What the fuck is going on in this country? Never asked that question, I warned her. Unless you already know the answer. I do, she said. We are fucked. Utterly fucked. The author's note, if it exists at all, is invariably the worst and lamest part of any book, my own included. That is because it is necessarily the last and most blind, dumb, desperate final touch that gets heaped into a book just before it goes to the printer. And the whole book, along with the two years of feverish work and anguish, is doomed to failure and ruined if the author won't produce the note in time for publication. Make no mistake about it. These four pointless pages of low-rent gibberish are by far the most important part of the book. They say nothing else matters. And so, with that baleful wisdom in mind, let us get on with the wretched task of lashing this author's note together, for good or ill. I'm not really in much of a mood to deal with it, no more than I'm eager to take a course in how to write commercial advertising copy for my own good at this time. I savagely... Uh, I savagely rejected that swill 40 years ago because I hated it, and I hated the people who tried to make me do it, but so what, eh? We are somehow back to square one. Is this a great country or what? The safe answer to that question is yes, and thank you for asking. Any other answer will get your name on the waiting list for accommodations at Guantanamo Bay. How's that for a great country, dude? It's all yours now, and good luck in jail! Cuba is a beautiful island, perhaps the most beautiful I have ever seen. I don't call it the Pearl of the Antilles for nothing. The white sand beaches are spectacular, and every soft Caribbean breeze that you feel in the midnight air will speak to you of love and joy and atavistic romance. Indeed, the future looks good for Cuba, especially with the dollar economy that will come in when the entire island is converted to a spacious concentration camp for the USA, which is already happening. Little did President Theodore Roosevelt know, when he effectively annexed Cuba in 1906, that he had seized for his country what would later become the largest and most permanent prison colony in the history of the world. Good old Teddy. Everything he touched was doomed to be beautiful. The man could do no wrong. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, the raiders were whipping the shit out of the heavily favoured Broncos who were wallowing in their own condition red. Their top-ranked defence had gone all to pieces, and now they were being humiliated. George Bush is far greater than Roosevelt, said my lawyer. I wish we could be with him now. You fool! I snorted. If Teddy Roosevelt were alive now, he would be so ashamed of this country he would slit his own wrists. So what? I still have to get to Boston tomorrow, she muttered. Will any planes be flying? Just then the football game was interrupted again, this time by a paid commercial about the terrors of smoking marijuana. Jesus Christ, she said. Now they say if I smoke this joint, I'll be guilty of murdering a federal judge. Hell, that's a capital crime. That's a death penalty. You're right, I replied. And if you even offer the filthy little thing to me, I will be guilty under the law of conspiring to murder a federal judge. Well, guess we just have to stop smoking this stuff, she said mournfully as she handed the joint to me. What else can I smoke to relax after a losing day in court? Nothing, I said. Especially not Xanax. The governor of Florida just sentenced his own daughter to jail for trying to buy Xanax. And so much for drug talk, eh? Even talking about drugs can get you looked up these days. The times have changed drastically, but not for the better. I like this book. I especially like the title, which pretty well sums up the foul nature of life in the USA in these first few bloody years of the post-American century. Only a fool or a whore would call it anything else. It would be easy to say that we owe it all to the Bush family from Texas, 
but that would be too simplistic. They are only errand boys for the vengeful, bloodthirsty cartel of raving Jesus freaks and super-rich moneymongers who have ruled this country for at least the last 20 years, and arguably for the past 200. They take orders well, and don't ask too many questions. The real power in America is held by a fast-emerging new oligarchy of pimps and preachers who see no need for democracy or fairness or even trees, except maybe the ones in their own yards, and they don't mind admitting it. They worship money and power and death. Their ideal solution to all the nation's problems would be another hundred-year war. Coming of age in a fascist police state would not be a barrel of fun for anybody, much less for people like me, who are not inclined to suffer Nazis gladly and feel only contempt for the cowardly flad suckers who would gladly give up their outdated freedom to live for the mess of pottage they have been conned to believing will be the freedom from fear. Ho, ho, ho. Let's not get carried away here. Freedom was yesterday in this country. Its value has been discounted. The only freedom we truly crave today is freedom from dumbness. Nothing else matters. My life has been the polar opposite of safe, but I am proud of it, and so is my son, and that is good enough for me. I would do it all over again without changing the beat, although I have never recommended it to others. That would be cruel and irresponsible and wrong, I think, and I am none of those things. Whoops. That's it, folks. We are out of time. Sorry. Mahalo. HST. P.S. The difference between the almost right word and the right word is the difference between the lightning bug and the lightning. Mark Twain. Part 1. When the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. There are no jokes. Truth is the funniest joke of all. Muhammad Ali. The Mailbox, Louisville, summer of 1946. My parents were decent people, and I was raised, like my friends, to believe that police were our friends and protectors. The badge was a symbol of extremely high authority, perhaps the highest of all. Nobody ever asked why. It was one of those unnatural questions, better left alone. If you had to ask that, you were sure as hell guilty of something, and probably should have been put behind bars a long time ago. It was a no-win situation. My first face-to-face -face confrontation with the FBI occurred when I was nine years old. Two grim-looking agents came to our house and terrified my parents by saying that I was a prime suspect in the case of a federal mailbox being turned over in the path of a speeding bus. It was a federal offense, they said, and carried a five-year prison sentence. No, no, wailed my mother. Not in prison. That's insane. He's only a child. How could he have known? The warning is clearly printed on the mailbox, said the agent in the grey suit. He's old enough to read. Not necessarily, said my father sharply. How do you know he's not blind? Or a moron? Are you a moron, son? The agent asked me. Are you blind? Were you just pretending to read that newspaper when we came in? He pointed to the Louisville Courier Journal on the couch. That was in the sports section, I told him. I can't read all the other stuff. See, said my father. I told you he was a moron. Ignorance of the law is no excuse, the brown suit agent replied. Tampering with the U.S. mail is a federal offense punishable under federal law. The mailbox was badly damaged. <laughs>